my dear students, uh, the neat exam is on the head. Uh, so let's have uh, this this kind of quick topic reviews in just 10 minutes. I'm sure all of you are, there's absolutely no time for anything else. So let's try to refresh some of the most, um, uh, you know, confusing uh, uh, topics or the topics which you feel that you need little extra push. So let's try to cover up a few of those topics. And the first two topics which we thought we'll cover will be on periodontal sutures and the, the, the recently given 2017 periodontal classification. We have observed in the in the mock exams that we have been giving that suturing techniques, irrespective of how many more times we do it, you be yet go wrong. Okay. Similarly, periodontal classification, any question given, we have seen that it's hardly 15% of the students who really get that correct, right? Simply because we have not probably been exposed to it during a UG, even though there are micro teaching lectures which is there in your BDS Next app, I'm not sure how many of you will have seen it, right? So kindly do not um, miss this. Let's watch it completely. 10 minutes, full focus, okay? Right, so we'll start with the sutures now. The first and the most basic is what is called a simple loop suture. If you see this very carefully, we are entering the, with the needle from the buccal aspect and then the needle from below the flap. So from the below the flap itself, I am taking it through the lingual side and then I take it out and then I give a suture. It looks very simple here, but in effect or in reality, what basically happens is, uh, suppose this is my buccal and my lingual flap. I take the needle from here, my needle comes out automatically, obviously because it's turned, it's a 3-8 needle, then my needle is going to move out, right? And then I get it back and then I hold my lingual flap and then I insert it from inside. It's not as simple as it is shown schematically. In fact, the much easier way of doing a suturing is your figure of eight suturing technique. This is the figure of eight. What happens in figure of eight? This is my buccal lingual. I pass it from the buccal aspect. It comes out, so the needle comes out easily. And then I, again, I'm going from the outside. I'm not going from the inside like my simple loop suture. So can you see this? I, I'm entering from the buccal aspect, sorry. I am entering from the buccal aspect and the uh, needle comes out and again I enter the lingual flap again from the outer aspect, not from the inner aspect like we did for my simple loop, right? So it moves like this, moves out like that, moves out like this and comes out. There you have your interrupted figure of eight suture, okay? So whatever accessibility is not that great, I go in for what is called as an interrupted figure of eight. Next. Sling suture, commonly asked for exams, even recently asked for exams. What is a sling? The sling is something like this. Okay, I have a buckle and my lingual flap. I insert my needle only on the flap that I have exposed or only for the, for the flap probably I have reflected uh, or only for one of the flaps, not for both the flaps. Okay, so only, for example, only the buckle aspect. Now, can you see this? So this is my buckle aspect. I'm, ent I'm, I'm entering from this side. I go all around the tooth. I am not entering my lingual flap at all. Through the inter interdental area, I, I take my needle out. Again, I insert it through the buccal uh, side. Uh, okay, uh, And then I take my needle off. And then I take it around like this and form a nice sling to it. And then I suture it up. A sling is needed to hold the flap towards the tubo, towards the tooth. You know, you just hold it. It not it not only gives that a position, but it, it lifts your flap up a little bit. It slightly coronally displaces your flap and it holds it against the tooth. Now, this kind of an action is what is called as a sling suture. What you have to remember is only one side of the flap is engaged. The other side of the flap is left intact. Can you see this here? Both the sides, uh, both the for sling, whereas <coughs> this. It's just a catapult, it goes all around the tooth, whereas both your bite, the needle bite, is on one side of the flap only. So this is what is called as your single interrupted sling suture. <clears throat> right. Next, we have two very important sutures. One is called as a horizontal mattress, the other one is vertical mattress. Please look at the diagram very carefully. You cannot go wrong. Horizontal means my suture thread will remain parallel to my incision line. Whereas when it's a vertical, vertical mattress, they remain perpendicular, perpendicular to my incision line. Very simple. For example, vertical mattress suture, I have two papillas. I have to reposition the papillas very nicely for good aesthetic appeal, you know. Then I, uh, I have to, then I give what is called as vertical mattress. Now the word mattress, as I've explained in the classes before, my dear students, mattress means entering the same side of the flap twice same side of the flap twice. That is what is called as a mattress suture. For example, uh, let's see this uh, vertical mattress. I insert it from here. I go down. Again, I take it out. 
and then I enter from my this side I, I, uh, and then I you know so what basically I'm trying to do is the same side of the flap my flap is going to be inserted twice that's what is a mattress suture okay vertical mattress is very good for papillary uh, uh, positioning of the sutures and and both of them whether it is horizontal or vertical mattress the skin the the skin you know remains averted after you give these sutures right and um, a horizontal mattress especially when because of tension you would like to hold it down there that is when you give a proper horizontal mattress suture okay so you have both of these right so we've done the basic we have done the interrupted we have done the sling we've done what is horizontal mattress we've understood what is mattress we've done the vertical and now we're moving on to this now look at the diagram very carefully okay look at this a i have inserted this from the buccal aspect my needle and then he goes all around the tooth and then again he inserts in the buckle. So this is very similar to which suture? The sling suture, which we just studied. Why? Because he has not touched the lingual. He has just uh, taken a bite from the buckle side, gone all around the tooth, and again taken a bite again from the buckle aspect. You understanding what's happening? And then if you see this very carefully, once he has taken out from the buckle aspect, he has entered the flap twice. And that is what is called as a mattress. In this case, a horizontal mattress. So he takes it all around like this horizontally, parallel to the incision line, or parallel to the your tooth over here and then he takes one more bite and then comes out and again forms a sling again goes out again forms a mattress so this kind of a uh, uh, suturing technique is what is called as a continuous independent sling suture with the use of a horizontal mattress so what we see here in the middle is a horizontal mattress given along with a continuous uh, independent sling suture okay horizontal mattress when you need more of an a position okay now let's see this in this case, what's happening here, he has inserted it from the buccal aspect. It goes all around the tooth. Again, he has taken it from the buccal aspect. And then, you know, he, he moves out. So he's continuously going. Uh, he's just doing a, a sling, 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 sling. It's just continuous sling. There is no mattress over here. Once he finishes the buccal aspect, then he, he comes around and then he gives the sling. Uh, the same way as you give sling from the buccal, he gives the sling from the lingual aspect also. That also can be done. Then this is what is called as a continuous independent sling suture where we don't have the mattress like your previous diagram okay so uh, this is used to adapt the buccal and lingual flaps without tying the you know, of course they are independent you don't tie the buccal to the lingual buccal is to buccal lingual is to lingual okay only thing is that it goes all around the tooth that's why it's called as a sling suture so i'm hoping that all these suturing techniques are okay just focus on the diagrams okay the next one is anchor suture very important, the anchor, sometimes students get confused, sir, so, so what is anchor suture, what is distal wedge suture, please note, whether it is mesial wedge or distal wedge suturing, what you're doing, usually done after distal surgery or whatever, that is called as an anchor suture. The funda is that your, your needle, just like a sling suture, you're taking the suture, you're taking the needle and the suture all across the tooth. For example, let's see this here. I take the needle from my buccal aspect, right i take it all around the tooth right and then again i i take a bite from there right and then i move out and then from the and then i insert this needle into the lingual aspect over here and then i take it out and then i give a, a suture okay so i am not entering i am not piercing my lingual aspect of the flap directly no i go from the buckle I like a sling suture, I take it all around the tooth like this, I take a bite and then I come down here and then I take a bite over here and then uh, I, I give a suture. Now this is what is called as an anchor suture. So this is for done for a distal wedge uh, procedure, it can be done for a mesial or a distal wedge. So the closing of a flap, mesial or distal to a tooth as in a mesial or distal wedge procedure is best accomplished by an anchor suture. So let me repeat again, I take it from the buckle. I don't go to the lingual directly, okay? So I go all around the tooth, right? And then I come back. I go all around the tooth. I come back and then I enter my lingual aspect and then I give my suture there. Got it? Next, <clears throat> we have something called as a closed anchor. The difference is closed anchor is specifically done for area which is edentulous behind a tooth, right? So the another technique is to close a flap that is located in the edentulous area mesial or distal aspect of a tooth. So the, here we see there's an edentulous area, distal to a tooth. The difference is, I give a proper, it's like a simple loop suture that I give initially. So I give a bite from the buckle, it goes through the lingual, I give a bite through my lingual, I take it out, 
right? I go there to the opposite side. And then I give a proper, just like I've given the initial sling suture, I take it all around the tooth like that. And then I anchor it down there by giving this kind of a suture. This is what is called as a closed anchor suture. The biggest difference among the anchor and the closed anchor is the way you engage your lingual flap. Right? In your distal wedge suture or your anchor suture, plain anchor suture, give it from the buckle, take it all around the tooth and then I go to the lingual and then I give a suture. I give a knot. Uh, whereas in my closed anchor, I start from the buckle, I go to the lingual directly, I take it out and then I take it all across the tooth and then I, I anchor it by giving a knot over there. So this is what is called closed anchor. The difference is here, it is an edentulous. It needs a proper edentulous area. Okay? Next. We come to the last of sutures. This is called the periosteal suture. Whenever you've done an apically displaced flap, you know, that is when you give a periosteal suture because you are engaging the periosteum basically. There are two kinds of sutures. One is called as a holding suture and the other one is called as a closing. Holding is always the one which is given at the bottom. If you observe here, the holding suture is a horizontal mattress suture that is placed at the base of the flap so that it can be secured to a new position. So it is kept at the base of the flap. On the other hand, this small sutures at the top, they are called the closing sutures. They are used to secure the flap edge to the periosteum. So you have uh, a holding suture at the bottom and then you have a, um, sorry, and then you have a closing suture at the top. So this completes your sutures. I'm hoping that this is clear all of you. Simple loop, figure of eight, sling, a continuous sling with a mattress, simple continuous independent suture. Then we had your anchor, whether it mesial or distal wedge. Then we had closed anchor, right? Closed anchor, edentulous area, buckle to lingual. You give a nice simple loop. You take it and then you take it to the other side and then you take it across the tooth and then you give a knot. And then the last one is periosteal, again classified as uh, uh, holding or a closing suture. And when do you give it? Simple. Okay, this is what majorly, this is what you should know for perio suturing techniques. Got it? Let's move on. Let's focus on this very, very well. <clears throat> Another five minutes, okay? Now, periodontal classification, uh, the earlier classification was given in the year 1999 by the AAP. And this classification was not only given by the AAP, but also modified by what is called as an EFP. EFP stands for uh, Euro uh, European Federation of Periodontology in the year 2017. So what are the basic or the most important differences, you know? One of the biggest differences, there is no aggressive periodontitis. You know how the name started coming, right? Initially, it was called as rapidly progressive periodontitis, early onset. Then they had juvenile periodontitis. They removed all that. They called it aggressive. Now they've removed aggressive. Now they say that aggressive is just like a normal periodontitis case, which, which, which progresses a little more faster. Not little more, much more faster. So you don't have aggressive periodontitis at all. They're all called as periodontitis itself but they just classified into different stages and different grades. So my dear students, just focus and try to understand what exactly this classification is all about. Okay, now, firstly, what are the various things they have introduced in the classification, right? So we see here, there is the periodontal health and gingival health. There is pure periodontitis. This is where even your aggressive periodontitis comes. Um, then other conditions affecting the periodontium, like for example, your mucogingival deformities, periodontal lapses, traumatic occlusal forces, all of that comes in other conditions affecting the periodontium because for each of them, the pathogenesis is different. And then they've introduced a new thing called as peri-implant diseases, right? So you have peri-implant health, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Peri-implant health means... Uh, the implant is healthy, right? There could be a little amount of inflammation, but it's not really visible on the outer aspect. So it's very good. There's pre-implant health. Mucositis, there is, like we have gingivitis, there is inflammation, but there's no loss of bone. Bone is not involved. The minute bone is involved, then you call it as peri-implantitis, right? And then if there's too much of bone loss and soft tissue loss, then you call it as peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies, right? Okay. Now, there is a wonderful term which they've introduced called as periodontal health. Now, uh, another one more term which is very important with this classification is what is called as a reduced periodontium. What exactly is this, right? So, for example, this is a tooth, right? This had loss of bone till there. You've done periodontal surgery and all that. You're given the suture and then the patient is 
beautiful the patient is maintaining the condition very well right so in the older classifications the minute we see this bone loss you know we give the patient is having periodontitis but actually in essence this is a patient who has been treated with periodontitis is very healthy he does not have a probing depth he has just inflammation all around this area right so in those conditions can you still call it as periodontitis no then we call it as gingivitis on a reduced periodontium right this is what is called reduced periodontium that means even though the patient will have bone loss but his remaining periodontium is quite healthy i mean the disease is not progressive then you call it as a gingivitis on a reduced periodontium but just understand that there is something called as reduced periodontium um, so just because there is bone loss you cannot call that as periodontitis okay right now now coming to the area where they're going to quiz you and they're going to ask you a lot of questions is there is there are two terms my dear students one is called staging the other one is called grading and please understand what i'm going to tell you let's assume that a patient has come to your clinic he has middle third bone loss now he's asking you doctor how is my condition and what should i do so just you giving his you describing his condition and telling him his treatment plan is what is called as staging what is it you describing what condition the patient has what is the kind of bone loss he has what is the kind of probing depth he has how many tooth has he lost due to periodontitis okay and telling him the proposed treatment plan is what is called as staging grading on the other hand is when the patient asks you doctor will my disease continue or will it stop or what is it the progression of the disease is what is called as grading in staging i am not worried about the progression of the disease but in grading i am worried about the progression of the disease what do you understand i have a patient of aggressive periodontitis i have a normal patient obviously when i am giving a grading for a patient with aggressive periodontitis i know the disease progression is much higher so i'll give him a much higher grade because i know that the disease is going to progress very very fast in this case whereas in the other case the disease is very very slow whereas in your general chronic periodontitis i'm hoping that it's clear okay now let's uh, take this up now staging is classified as 1 2 3 and 4 okay there are the four stages 1 2 3 4 what are the conditions you would consider first you have severity then we have complexity and then we have extent and dist distribution in severity you just remember the password cbt or a computer based test you know as we give normally c stands for clinical attachment level b stands for bone loss radiographic bone loss t stands for tooth loss so this is cbt these are three factors which come under severity now let's look clinical attachment loss can be 1 to 2 mm 3 to 4 greater than or equal to 5 greater than or equal to 5 so it's very simple in stage 1 and stage 2 1 to 2 3 to 4 greater than or equal to 5 right come next is bone loss okay how much is the bone loss bone loss only till the coronal third coronal third means suppose this is the root this can be the coronal third this is the middle third and this is the apical third hai na hai na so this coronal third is roughly 33% 33 33 33 33 33 is 99 or 100% hai na so if it is only till 15% of bone loss you call it as stage 1 15 to 33% you call it as stage 2 and anything beyond that that means uh, anything beyond the coronal that means it, the, the there is bone loss till the middle third or the bone loss till the apical third as the case may be you call it as stage 3 or stage 4 then where is the difference the difference comes in tooth loss how many tooth has the patient lost in stage 1 and stage 2 there is no loss of tooth whereas in stage 3 there is loss but it is lower than 4 and in stage 4 he has lost more than 5 teeth you need to learn this table if you still not learned it yet the next one is complexity please note even though we speak we say periodontitis the first thing that comes to your mind is probing depth here i'm not worried about the probing depth i'm first in severity i'm worried about cbt that is clinical attachment level radiographic bone loss and tooth loss the next one comes complexity in complexity the first thing i'm going to check for is the probing depth so in stage 1 and stage 2 for example stage 1 the maximum probing depth is lower than 4 stage 2 the probing depth is lower than 5 stage 3 it goes beyond that so stage 3 the probing depth can be greater than 6 stage 1 and stage 2 usually has horizontal bone loss when it comes to stage 3 it's horizontal it could be a little amount of vertical bone loss forcation involvement all of that can be there 
when it comes to stage 4 it could be much severe form there's a lot of ridge deficiencies you know bone collapse severe ridge defects masticated dysfunction all of that comes in what is called as stage 4 or the complexity of the disease so what comes in complexity probing depth and ridge defect extent and distribution i think is the same as the earlier classification if it's localized lower than 30 percent of the teeth if it is generalized it is greater than that okay so this is what is called a staging right so in the recent or the 14th edition of Karanza, which has come they've given different names like for example stage one is called mild disease stage two is moderate stage three is severe stage four is very severe same things what we have just learned in the table what all for example in your stage one probing depth is going to be lower than four let me come back here the probing depth is going to be lower than four then he goes to um, CAL the clinical attachment level has to be one it's interdental no? it's one to two mm horizontal bone loss lower than 15 he will require non-surgical treatment and no post-treatment loss expected you understand what I'm saying patient has come to you you're giving a staging and so staging means you're going to describe to the patient what his existing condition is what is a proposed treatment plan and if he's going to lose any teeth right for example you look at stage three probing depth clinical level uh, what is the bone loss treatment he will require initially non-surgical followed by surgical treatment loss of four or fewer teeth higher risk of tooth loss due to periodontitis moderate ridge defect so this is what is called as staging right remember the keywords they are severity complexity sextant and distribution you need to learn this table but it's very simple like for example clinical attachment level is 1 to 2 3 to 4 greater than 5 greater than 5 bone loss up to 15 15 to 33 more than that right i mean middle third apical one third and it goes like that in both of them it can go beyond the middle even to the apex okay so it goes like then tooth loss no tooth loss lower than four and greater than five teeth which are involved now we have done the staging you know, you know how to classify it stage one is mild moderate severe very severe now we go to grading what is the key word grading grading means progression progression okay now grading can again be classified as one is the primary criterion and grade modifiers let's do the grade modifiers first what is grade modifier suppose there's a normal patient and a patient who's diabetic obviously a patient who's diabetic his progression is going to be more severe if he's a smoker his progression is going to be more severe as simple as that okay now we have three grades a b and c slow moderate rapid so what do you have you have two important risk factors smoking and diabetes okay in slow is a non-smoker he has no diabetes in, in moderate grade or grade b as you call it he smokes lower than 10 cigarettes 10 cigarettes Bhagavan. okay anyway lower than 10 cigarettes and um, diabetes is lower than 7 whereas rapid rate look at the look at the hp a1c greater than 7 right or in some books 7.1 and above and uh, he smokes greater than 10 cigarettes per day so these are what is called as grade modifiers okay now primary criterion you can again classify it as direct evidence or indirect evidence this might look a little hodgepodge now because there are too much of data but when you just listen to it two three times then it becomes very simple to understand okay direct evidence is you're directly looking at the tooth loss look at look at you are looking at an x-ray and you are coming to the conclusion oh there is so much of bone loss you know so how do you say if there is no loss of bone over five years slow rate over five years he is lost lower than two mm of bone over five years he has lost greater than two mm of bone right suppose if you should pay, uh, suppose the patient is of aggressive you know that he will have grade c because he would have definitely lost more than two mm of bone which is greater than uh, you know uh, over a period of five years the next thing indirect evidence of progression depends on two factors one percentage of bone loss based on the patient's age and plaque deposit now for example percentage of bone loss divided by the age okay so grade a is 0.25 grade b is 0.25 to 1 grade c is greater than 1 so what is this let me tell you suppose a, pa a patient has 25 percent bone loss and he is only 25 years of age right so 25 by 25 the ratio is 1 1 means very rapid rate of progression on the other hand this particular patient has 25 percent of bone loss and he is 75 years so that is 25 by 
75 or 1 by 3. 1 by 3 is roughly around 0 0.33. 0 0.33, that means he has a moderate level of bone loss. Very simple. That is what is meant by percentage of bone loss divided by age. Right. The next one is case phenotype. Case phenotype means amount of plaque. Right. For example, the grade A, you might have a lot of plaque. Right. But there is low level of destruction. Grade B, uh, he has plaque and for that there is equal amount of destruction. Grade C, the plaque is not there much but he has severe amount. Again pointing towards the older aggressive periodontitis. Right? Destruction exceeds the expectation of the given biofilm. Very little biofilm but destruction is very very heavy. Now simple, this is what is called as grading. Staging, 1, 2, 3, 4. Again you have you know severity, complexity and all that. And then we have grading, A, B, C, slow, moderate, rapid, right? You have um, you have a direct evidence of progression, how much of bone loss over five years. Indirect evidence, bone loss divided by age or the amount of plaque. Risk modifiers, you can have diabetes and you can have smoking. These factors to be kept for grading. So you will classify the patient as stage 3, grade B or stage 4, grade C, stage 2, grade A. So you're going to give grade based on the progression. Staging, what is the patient's condition? That is why you have two different levels in this new classification. Okay, now let's look at this case. A 55-year-old male patient has, uh, has lost up to three teeth. Clinical attachment loss is around 5 mm. Radiographic bone loss in teeth shows vertical bone loss extending to the middle third. Right, now the minute you see that there is vertical bone loss up to middle third, He's asking, so the minute there is bone loss up to middle third, what did we learn uh, in stage 1 and stage 2? Stage 1, lower than 15% bone loss. Stage 2, 15 to 33. Middle and beyond, it could be stage 3 or stage 4. But what is he said? One more clue here. The patient has lost up to 3 teeth. Up to 4 teeth. Up to 4 teeth. You call it as stage 1. So can you see this? Up to 4 teeth. Is stage, uh, sorry, is stage 3. And beyond that, you call it as stage 4. Whereas stage 1 and stage 2, you don't have any uh, loss of tooth. So that is all that is needed to solve this question. So this particular question, uh, how do you rate the stage? You call it as stage 3. Simply because he has lower than 4 teeth missing. His clinical attachment level is 5. It is 5 for both 3 and stage 4. And bone loss, bone loss. Uh, is uh, is um, more than middle or apical third. I mean, more than the middle third of the tooth. So it's very clearly a case of stage three, right? Next one. If the patient has a value of 0.76, that is percentage of bone loss by age, what is the grading? I've just explained. If it is lower than 0.25, you call it as grade A. If it is between 0.25 uh, to one, you call it as grade B. And if it is, let me show that to you again. Uh, grade A, 0.25. Grade B, 0.25 to one. Grade C greater than 1. So, he's saying the patient has 0.76. That means he's a case of grade B. You don't have grade D at all. Okay, done. What is the staging of periodontitis in a patient with radiographic bone loss of 40%? Very simple, right? Lower than 15 is 1. 15 to 33 is 2. Anything more than that is 3. He's saying 40%, right? So, 40% is safer uh, to say that it is mainly a case of stage 3. Um, yeah, stage 3 is extending to middle third of the root and beyond. Whereas in stage 4, extending to middle third of the beyond and even to the apical third. It can even go till almost to the apical third. Stage 4 is more destructive. 40% is very close to 33. So it's best to go for a stage 3 rather than a stage 4. I'm hoping that your periodontal classification, suturing I'm sure 2-3 times you see it, you understand. Uh, uh, but periodontal classification, you should be very thorough with staging. I'm stopping now, but I need you to look at these tabular columns. What is stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4? What is grading? And in the recent to the 14th edition of Karanza, he has called stage 1 as a mild disease, moderate disease, severe and very severe disease. So please have this in your mind. Again, let me come back to you. When you say staging, in severity, you have CBT. You don't have probing depth. CBT is what? CBT is CAL, that is clinical attachment level. It is bone loss and you have tooth loss. Whereas when you have complexity, that is where your probing depth comes in, right? It, it can be uh, lower than 4 mm. It can be lower than 5 mm. or And after that, it is it does not make a difference. If it's more than 5, uh, from stage 3 and stage 4, it is more than that, 6 and above, okay? So that is what is called as stage 3. Is it okay, all of you? I'm hoping that I've given some kind of an idea about suturing and periodontal classification.
Thank you.